Well, good evening, folks. I'm glad to see you back here at the New Providence Baptist Church. We're having our, our prayer meeting tonight. Uh, I am Johnny Walker, if you don't know who I am. Um, I haven't done this in a long while. I've been in the choir, and Preacher Mark has had others to, to be here. Of course, Preacher Mark was always a, a good goal. He, he always, always called, called me just about, about a couple hours, hours before this would happen, and he'd always put me on the spot, Johnny on the spot. But uh, tonight, uh, we're going to be in our book of Matthew, if you got your book. I'm going to read some Beatitudes to you and then talk about loving your enemies. Of course, a lot of you may have some enemies, may not have any enemies. But it's good to have you out there on the Internet tonight. Uh, we'll be able to do these things. Let me, before I start off, I'm going to make a couple announcements. Women's Bible study is on Sunday evening at 6 o'clock, and if you need a book, it's $10. And Operation Christmas Child... Uh, to get your boxes. Uh, there's plenty of them up there if you hadn't got any. And uh, that's all I know right at the minute for announcements. But let's have a word of prayer and then we'll get started, okay? Heavenly Father, again, we come to your throne of grace and thank you again for your marvelous grace and your understanding and your love. We love you, Lord, and we thank you for all that you do for us. We ask you now to continue to help us through this Bible study. We might learn something to love not just our enemies, but to love everyone. Continue to give us strength and courage and wisdom. We'll give you all the praise and glory and honor in Jesus' precious name. Amen. And if you've got your Bibles, it opened up to chapter 5 of Matthew. This is the Beatitudes. I'm going to read the Beatitudes before I get into my sermon tonight or, because it goes right along with what we need to know. I'm starting verse 3 of chapter 5. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And I'm reading now the King James Version. If you've got a different version, that's just fine. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are they, the, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteous sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall rail you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they, the prophets for which were before you. That's a pretty good statement. I like those. It tells you just exactly what you can do, what God will give to you. Especially that one when it says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Have you ever been anywhere in this world and work or whatever and see a fight, try to break it up or scuffle it. We had one many years ago at work, two women. Wasn't two men, it's two women. And I'm going to tell you right now, if you two women get into a fight anymore, they can fight. I'll not try to referee it. You get scratched, clawed, you get more of it than they got. But we must be a peacemakers about every one of us. Of course, uh, Jesus taught about this on the Sermon on the Mountain. He taught about us being the salt of the earth, the light of the world, Christ on the law, and Jesus on anger. If you'll study the book of Matthew, it'll tell you a lot of things you can live by day by day. Talked about teaching about adultery, on divorce, on taking oaths, but tonight I want to think about loving your enemies. This time in trials and tribulations of life, we have a lot of enemies. There's a lot of folks trying to make the churches go away. Uh, a lot of people hate people. I listened to Russell Spath the other night. He's in uh, Florida. I'm mean, sorry, he's in Myrtle Beach. He said he walks down the street and they curse him. He gives out tracts. Gives out tracts like this. I'm a tracky nut. I give out tracts. And they curse him. I said, well, Russ, what do you do? He said, I'll just tell him Jesus loves them. Sometimes they'll take them, sometimes they'll throw them away, sometimes they won't. But we have enemies, not just in the world, but even in our own households. 
even in the church of God, even in our own churches, we have enemies. People sometimes agree so much, so much, but sometimes then they'll say, well, I don't agree with you. I think Pastor Gary said last weekend somebody disagreed with him not having services on Wednesday nights. That's okay. You have to give an account for your words, your deeds in this life and the next life. We only have two lives. You know we have two lives. A short one and a long one. The short one is where you get everything ready for the long one. Eternity. A lot of people don't believe that, but we do. Because the Bible tells us back in the beginning, God created heavens and the earth. He created man, and he created him, and he breathed into him a living soul. We are accountable for every word, every idle thought, and every deed we do, we'll give an account for it one day. But let's start here in verse 38. Ye heard that in hath been said, an eye for an eye, and a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you that ye resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. Let's stop just there a minute. Now you've heard about this eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. Has anybody explained to me what that really meant back in those days? Just punishment to fit the crime. Sir? Just punishment to fit the crime. Well, that is true. Does that go back to where it says, do unto others as they have they do unto you? Or does that mean go unto others before they do unto you? See, that's a different story there. But he says back in those days, and what Jesus is teaching, an eye for an eye and a tooth for tooth. It says here, the just penalty for an eye for an eye or a tooth for tooth is that... It's in the book of Exodus, chapter verse 21, I mean chapter 21. And it means to end feuds, is what it means. They had a lot of feuding back then. We still have a lot of feuding today. Uh, one of the greatest feuds ever was with the Hatfields and the McCoys. But it's supposed to be end of feuds. And it says here that Jesus is saying that the method is not a license to get, have vengeance. Don't take vengeance on somebody. If you're a born-again child of God, you must do as Jesus taught. Example, don't give back. Take it. I see a young man in school one time. They got into a fight. A young man slapped him with a wet towel right across the face. Our first instinct is what? You're going to give me back to him. He turned back to him and said, no, he said, no, I've never done that. I never took what you say I took. He said, I never done that. And the young man slapped him on the other side with the towel. And then it cracked. I'm telling you, it was hard. And the young man turned back around. He said, I'm not fighting you. Get away from me. I didn't do those things you say I done. And he walked away from him. And later on, the young man found out that he did not. He went back and apologized to him. But he never raised his hand. One of the boys told him, told him afterwards, he said, He's a little bitty feller. Why do you knock him down? He said, that's not my way. That's not Jesus' way either. It says here in verse 39 that, that the, let me get my back paper back back here. It says that, but I say unto you that ye resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on the other cheek shall turn thee in also. And it says here that we must resist evil. That's exactly what it is, evil. Jesus showed us how that the believers should Respond to a personal injury. But our first, first thought is to reach back and draw back and knock them down. That's man's nature, is it not, David? Yeah. yeah. It's, that's our, it's our nature to reach back. But the disciple, as we're disciples, are not supposed to be the natural man anymore. We're supposed to be born again by God's grace. A new creature, right? We're supposed to not do those things. If someone would read Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, it goes right along with this. First one gets it there, read that. Yeah, 12, 1 and 2. I beseech you that you be therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your minds, that ye may prove what it is 
what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now there's a story, as Paul Harvey says, when somebody smacks you on the cheek, don't be grudging to hit somebody else. This is an everyday occurrence in this world, somewhere somebody's fighting. 99% of the time it's road rage. Willie, I've seen you drive. You can't drive uh, on the Indianapolis 500, let me tell you that. But I've seen you drive, and I've seen other people's. I, and there's some folks I've seen today, or one with the doctor yesterday. Oh my goodness, it's so dangerous to get on the road anymore. But it tells us in, that, in the book of Romans that we, we should present ourselves a living sacrifice. We should could present that. And a lot of people don't want to do that. But if you've been born again by God's grace, we must do what Jesus taught. We must. And, I'm, and it's so hard, but if over a lifetime of working with the Lord and the Lord working with you, these things shall come to pass. And he'll test you on them. When you think you've got it well done, he'll put you to the test and see if you can muster up. But we must continue on, as Jesus taught us, to present ourselves a living sacrifice. And when we do those things, what do we do? We change the person in front of us, and we change ourselves, because we know we've held our temper. And it says here in verse 40, If any man will sue thee at the law, and take away thy cloak, let him have thy cloak also. Well, Jesus taught on this, having confidence in the Almighty God that where he will take care of us completely, he will say eternal justice, and he'll give us eternal justice. And it tells us, I, I had a little verse here in the bottom of that, I wanted to read it to you. It says, the believers are willing to go, well, excuse me, that's the next one, I'm sorry. But it says here that a Roman soldier is, is what we're, they compare us to when we do evil or compare us to the devil, we should do. But Jesus gave us confidence that if somebody sues you, God Almighty will give you justice sooner or later. But what he was saying here, if he sues you, back then the inward, the inward cloak was what they put on the inside. It was not as expensive as the outer garment. The outer garment was more expensive. And they sued you for your inner one. He said, give me the outer one too. And they'll look at you. Well, uh, uh. I didn't give you, I, I didn't want that. Give them more than what they asked for. That heaps up coals of fire on their head when you be good to them. The Bible says they'll be changed. They'll begin to wonder and ponder, why would he do that for when I sued him? He's not mad at me because I sued him. Of course, in days now, they sue for everything that they got. But he says to be kind to them. Reading back with the, what we read in our Beatitudes. The Beatitudes... Helps us along the way, does it not? Let's see now, verse 41. I want to read it, verse 41. And whosoever shall come, c compel thee to go a mile, go with him twine. Now Jesus said that, that he taught back then that I think the Roman government, Roman soldiers or the officials, if they wanted back then to some people to go with him for, those extra miles, they had to carry their weapons and, or their materials, and they compelled them, they made them, it's, it's probably a, what do you call it, a um, uh, forced walking a mile. You're going to go with me. But now he was saying here, if somebody compels you to go, go with them. Somebody hitchhiking on the road, you're going from here to that exit, I can't go far, but I can take you a little ways. Go with them that extra mile. If they come out here and need you go to their house, go with them, or whatever. And Jesus is teaching us back in those early verses, we must be children of God and go and do what we need to do. And he says here that, I wrote this down, it says, in ancient times the government would always have forced entry to make this servicing. It says that uh, we, are to, we should be willing to go that extra mile, and not just the extra mile, but double it. Why would Jesus say, double it? You never know, he might be a lost person. We have a little bit more time to tell him about Jesus. Tell him how God has changed our life. It's not about us, guys. It's about Jesus. If it's about us, 
This church up here wouldn't have New Providence on it. It'd have Johnny Walker on it. Or Mark Caldwell or Gary Smith. It's about Jesus. It's not about us. It's about what his teachings is that we learn from them. And put it in every day uh, as we work together. Put it on everyday trials and tribulations. Verse 42, he says, Give him that asketh thee, and from him that would borrow, or thee turn not thou away. What's that saying? Willie, what was that saying? That we need to give extra to people when they ask us. And be always helping them. When they ask for something, they need something. We have it, we need to give it to them. Yeah. So it means the, the previous verse is if somebody asks me for some money, I need to double it. Yeah. Just yesterday, as I was getting gas, trying to figure out this technology. I'm not technology smart, folks. I'm from the old school. I put my card in, it comes up on the screen. Do you want so-and-so, or do you need the 15 cents off, or whatever? And as I was pushing the buttons, someone leaned over the pump and said, uh, You ain't got a couple extra dollars you have for, for gas, have you? And I said, I don't know. Hey, look, I put them bill phone. I said, No, but I've got five. Would that do? Oh, yes. So I gave them extra what they needed. As a young lady, she went in, come back out, pumped her gas. I was still figuring out how to get my gas to pump. But I figured it out. The computer was smarter than me. It came up with a question. Do you want to continue on or cancel? I said, continue on. And I got my gas. I had two people ask me this week for something. One asked me for money. The other one asked me for food. Now, are we willing to be used when God uses us? Uh, years ago, I'll tell you, years ago, when I told her to jump in so-and-so. Uh, somebody called me for about food. I said, "We'll get off and go to work." But I do. I have. I, God has convicted me on those folks giving, and it says here too. And it, I, I read this in the Bible. Here it says that uh, even beggars is to minister to through the provisions of living to give him an ask thee. The beggar. I was down in Alabama one time. This old boy came up, we had a big rig. We were, had to split it and get a big tank off of it, me and my uncle and his two boys. Wino comes up, he's staggering, smelly. Hey, you ain't got a dollar, have you, so I get me something to eat? Got a dollar? Got a dollar? Well, I gave him a dollar. Well, he went around to ask somebody else, and I seen him leave. There's a convenience store just shortly from where we was at. Of course, it was, had wine in it. He come back out, and he had two paper bags. One paper bag had a bottle in it. The other paper bag had food in it. It had a sandwich in it. They took it and broke it apart. And every which one of them, they get a drink out of the same bottle, but they all shared. There was four of them. They all shared with that. I thought, my goodness, if we could just learn that lesson ourselves to share with people. But, it, but I asked him, he come back the next day. And I asked him, I said, why did you do that? He said, because they're hungry and thirsty as I am. He said, they're my friends. Do we have friends like that? The Bible even teaches us that if one should wake you in the middle of the night, would you be willing to get up? Would you be willing to go? And it says here that uh, Jesus clearly taught that, that, that we should be able to love one another. The loving is, the, is what we should be doing. If we practice love and show love that we have the love of God in us, people will be noticing you and they'll begin to ask you. Uh, Anthony had asked me earlier about uh, being long-winded. Yes, sometimes I get long-winded. But at work, when I worked at, at work, when they seen me coming, those that didn't want to hear me, they'd turn off or go somewhere else or do something else. I tried to show them my love. We had a supervisor of our one time named Bill. I tried to witness to him many a time. As we come from through the two buildings, there was a smoking area from one side of the building. I never much more got through the door, and I heard two of them say, Well, here he comes again. Better watch it. He'll preach to you. I walked on by there, and I stopped, and I said, Guys, I ain't got time to tell you about Jesus loves you. 
and he's ready, and he's ready to, to, you know, you need to get right with God. I don't have time today. I've got too much to do. I walked on by. Well, later on, the bill, the supervisor told me, he said, you know, if nobody had anything to say, you said a lot in a few minutes, a few seconds. But if we love the Lord and we, love, and he, we keep his commandments, these will not be grievous to us when we love our enemies. Now, he'll put you to the test about loving your enemies. I mean, very much so. He will test you to see how much you do love. If you don't have any love inside of you, you ain't got nothing. You have to go back and check up again. It says here, verse uh, 43, Ye have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemies. But verse 44 says, I have said unto you, Love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. Pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Tell me about that. Tell me about them two verses. Anybody ever been used, persecuted, been took advantage of, lied to, trampled on, spit upon? I'm gonna tell you right now, folks. If you don't live in this, if you live in this world, you have had that done to you sooner or later, either by a stranger, or by your family members, or a close friend. I've had close friends that loved me so much I thought they never would part from me. But since I started speaking for the Lord, they don't want me around me. I've got one right now, and I'll call his name out, Wes James, if you're out there listening tonight. He's a lost young man. He can see me coming down the road. He'll go the other way in the car. Don't want to be around me. Many people like that. As many of you have done that, many people have been around you that you, they drive away from you, don't want to be around you. It says here, in verse 43, that have you heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy? Love is the verse that overwhelms. This is a love that comes only from God through the Holy Spirit. If we do not have that love, we cannot do these things. It's all about love. If you remember back when Jesus was hanging on the cross, before he hung him on the cross, they nailed him to the cross. The ladies were what? Weeping. He said, weep not for me, but for yourselves. Weep for yourselves because you don't understand. And a lot of people don't understand about what the love is. We don't do this, do things for people to get back. When you borrow money, when people borrow money from you, you don't borrow money because... Uh, because and, and lend it to them. Uh, Jesus told them that it said it should be a gift to them. Don't worry about getting it back. Don't worry about getting it back. Lend it to them. And this verse goes along with it when they said that they despitefully use you. They'll use you. I've had many people in this community use me, even use the church at times. We've had so many people stop out here at the cross and say their, their grandmothers have died in Florida. I don't know how they got any grandmothers left down there trying to get gas money, food, whatever. 99% of the time it's gas money. But what do we do here? We help. We have to help because the Bible says if they ask, we need to give. Sometimes we try to help them in, in different ways, but they don't want help. But it says here that uh, this is quality of love is commanded from God that we should love completely. Here it expresses by giving love to your enemies, doing good to them towards, in order to them they might you might win Christ, win them over to Christ, and that's the reason we do these things. If you remember back, many many years ago, before you accepted Christ, what did the Bible say you was? You was an enemy of God. Jesus hung on the cross to bring those ourselves together, not to be an enemy of God anymore. We are supposed to be born again believers by the blood of God, Christ, that brings us together. And we should love no matter what they do to us. I know Frankie's in a, a little place right now. She needs to love more. Don't you, Frankie? Sure. But, and we all do, especially it comes to our families. We need to love more. And when they, our families begin to see that we have true love from in us, even when they persecute you, even when the world persecutes you, and takes advantage of you. 
We should not go run around. Right now, David, I want to talk to you about this so-and-so down here that's borrowing money from me. We don't need to do that either. That's, that's a little gossiping. You don't need that. Keep it to yourselves. Pray about it. Let God handle it. And he will. But he may test you and test you time and time again to see how faithful you are for him. Paul the Apostle, you know, he said, Lord, I've got this thorn in my flesh. And he prayed to him three times, but he never moved it. And what did he say? My grace is sufficient. Grace is sufficient when people persecute you and say all manners of evil against you. They took me at work even. They took me to the office and said, well, far are you? Really? What for? Tell them about Jesus. Our plant manager back then was Gary Parisi. And Gary Parisi said, I don't see nothing wrong about telling about Jesus. Leave him alone. Go on back to work. Now, I've, it wasn't the first time I've been in the office for that. I leave tracks laying around. I leave them laying on, read them and leave them laying around. They don't like that. HR person lady come to me. She said, you can't do that. Well, I'm sorry. I'm absent-minded. I'll try to not do that anymore. But I leave them laying around. People need to know about Jesus. And it's our responsibilities, no matter where we're at or what we're doing, is take the time, tell them about Jesus. It don't take the minute to say, Jesus loves you. I went to the grocery store just here a while back. A young man seen my hat. I got a CSCIA hat on, Christian in action. He looked up at my hat and he said, that's a good, that's a good thing. I said, yes, it is. I said, God's always good. He said, yes. He said, it's a beautiful day out here. I'm glad it's, it's a good, beautiful day. I said, and uh, I said, well, you know, it don't matter what the day is. If you've got God in your heart, every day's a good day. And he stopped and he said, I never looked at it that way. And he walked on. We must be able to give them the truth when we get time. Anytime, any place, anywhere. It doesn't matter. And the, the devil will slip into you and try to get you off track. Just like that computer and I was looking on that computer watching it, trying to get that gas thing filled out. I'm not a smart person when it comes to this stuff here. I could work on the pump itself, but getting the computer part, I'm, I'm not it. I'm not it. But we must, we all still have a, a responsibility of loving our neighbors. Now we may not, and our enemies, we may not like their ways now. Jesus didn't say anything about their ways. He said to love them no matter what no matter what, to love them. Slapped in the face, persecuted, used, borrow, lend money from you. I think it tells us in the book of, of Proverbs, I think it's Proverbs chapter 7, I believe it is, it tells us about borrowing and lending. I uh, had it in my book here, I thought. <laughs> Proverbs uh, 22 verse 7, I think it is. I think I've got it here right quick. It tells us, it warns about borrowing and lending. It says here, the rich rules over the poor and the, the borrow is servant to the lender. Now, how's that talk to you? You're still indebted to him, right? Of course, if you look above the verse of chapter, six, uh, chapter 22, just the, the, the verse above that, it's a gut good one there. Verse 6 is, train up a child the way it should go. When it's old, it should not depart from it. But here we must show love to every enemy, every person that we have, because it is what Jesus commanded us to do. He said, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, teach them to observe all things, what's about to command you, and lo, I'm with you always to the end of the world. We must continue to do that. It says here that in verse uh, 45, and 46, I believe it is. For they, for ye may be the children of your fathers, which is in heaven. For he maketh his son, make his son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and the unjust. For if ye love them which love you, what reward have you? Do you not even the publican the same? It tells us here that, <laughs> that we should uh, be the children of our Father. Are we the children of our Father? It says here that Jesus reminds us that we are to love our enemies as our brothers. For even the publican loves the people around him. 
And of course, the publican is a sinner back then. The publicans were the uh, political Jewish officers that, uh, who worked in the Roman government as tax collectors, and they didn't like them. Matthew was a publican. They, were, they called him a traitor, I think they called him. But the publicans even loved people. They loved their families too. They love them just as they like anybody else. It says here that, that in 1 John, 1 John 3, chapter 14 and 15, this is what I want to bring out with this. What John was saying about the same thing he was talking about here that Jesus was. Verse 14. We know we have passed from death unto life because we have loved the brethren. He that loveth his brother abideth in death. Did not love his brother, abideth in death. And whosoever hates his brother is a murderer. And ye know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. Death and life is the belief and unbelief. The believer and unbeliever. A murderer whose heart is full of hate or evil, can be forgiven, just like anybody else. If not, Moses would have done a great thing because Moses was a murderer. See here, but who is truly forgiven? Who would be truly forgiven? Anybody that ask. No longer will that man abide in murder state. He will quit those things. Just like he says, when we're born again by God's grace, we are new creatures, right? Depart from the old ways. We are a new creature. Even Jesus said, the world hated me while I was here. They'll hate you while you're here. So if they, when they begin to persecute you and hate you, remember, the Bible, Paul the Apostle said to rejoice in those things. Even John, uh, 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 Jesus said to rejoice in those things. It says to continue on. We are to continue to do what God wants us to do. And remember, if you hate your brother, you don't have no eternal life in you. The Bible even says back earlier that said if, if you hate your brother for a cause, what's going on? Hate him for another cause. How many have run into road rage today and got the California Howdy salute or Got to holler that, and what did you do back to them? You don't have to answer that. I, I get so frustrated when I drive because there's so people, so many out there that's driving so fast over the speed limit. This is the only generation I've ever seen that's trying to kill themselves by going to work or to the Walmart or to the grocery store or somewhere. They fly. They don't drive, they fly. I think they need to invent the cars that got wings on them. That, that way they will get there quicker. But I don't understand them. They just, they're, they're so fast anymore. So fast. But it says here in verse 16 and 17, Hereby perceive we the love of God. Now here's what the love of God is. It says because he laid down his life for us. Plain and simple. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Uh-oh. You mean I got to quit putting up hay and come over here and preach to youngs? I mean, I got to quit going over, doing what I'm doing, go over and get Willie's lawnmower going? Or go over at David's and help him drag a dead deer out or something? No matter what we're doing, when somebody asks, we need to be drop what we're doing and go. My daddy was a good example of that. He'd leave hay in his field he was cutting and go cut the neighbor's hay and put it up before he come back and cut his. They asked. They weren't able to do it, but he was. And that's what we should do. It says here, But whosoever hath this world's goods, and see his brother hath need, and shut up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? Plain and simple. The standard for our love is God's love in Christ who died for us. Love that sees need, and does not act upon it, there is no love there. Plain and simple. The, this comes from the inside of our deepest nature, our deepest appointments. So, what's in your heart today? 
You've heard that old commercial, what's in your wallet? What's in your heart today? The heart of mankind is where it starts. It's just a little 15 ounce, it's not even a pound. It depends on what's your size, but it average about 15 ounces, the heart. It beats 60 times a minute, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 52 weeks a year, for how many years? Some have a long life, some have a short life. But it's just a muscle. But the Lord said it comes from the heart, the love does. There's 101 verses in the back of the book that teaches about the heart. But the heart, man believeth unto righteousness, and confession is made unto, with the mouth of salvation. The heart is about where we're at. It's like that old saying is, what's in your heart today? Is it in because of God loves you or not? It says here, if you read this, next, this 17th verse again, let's read it again, and we'll put the English standard word in here. But whosoever has this world's goods and see his brother have need and shut up his heart from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? We shut up our hearts. That's those folks standing on the side of the road with a sign too, folks. They're asking. You never know when you might be standing on the side of the road asking too in this day of trials and tribulations of life because I get cards in the mail all the time. I want to buy your property. I want your property. I want your property. Dad, uh, my grandfather's got a place up here. We want to buy your property. We want to buy this property. Well, it's not for sale. They still send letters. They still call. We, got, we want to buy your property. Property is so high right now it's unreal. Houses, they're building houses, and the, the, the materials has gone out of sight, and people are looking for a place to rent. They won't rent them now because they're selling them to people. We must know what's in our own heart when it comes to ministering outside these walls here. It's in our hearts. And if we've been born again by God's grace, if we're a child of the King, we must know what's in our heart. It says here, verse Verse 18, My little children, let us not love in words, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Show them. Just don't say, well, I'm going to go down here and help him and go over by them. Well, I'll get you next time. Don't do that. Do Take into action. It's an acting thing of our heart. We must take action. If we don't take action, well, you never know. Uh, I'd done that one time coming down the interstate a few years ago. I was in a hurry to get back. I had to, it was in a Sunday afternoon. I had to get back to church. I was in a hurry to get back to church. Nothing wrong with that, is there? I was running late. But I passed a man walking down the third, had his shoes on his shoulder. He just barely was walking. Looked like he's just ready to fall over. And I was zoom, running by him. I got close to Sugar Land Mexit. I turned back around and I got out and went back up, come back down. I never found him. I may have passed up God himself, may have passed up an angel. Where it says to entertain angels, for unawarely you may be entertaining, or as strangers you may be entertaining angels. And I passed him up. I try not to do that anymore. But I passed him up. I should have stopped and helped. You never know who it might have been. We must help people. But if we don't have much, God will supply that. Give what you can. God will supply it. I, he's, I, back years ago when I, when I started in the ministry, I was going to work, driving to work. It took me $12 to drive to town and back. I mean to go to work and back for a week in my old car. All right, I have not got my gas yet. Pulled up to Walmart to get gas, and his guy sitting over the sign on his. He needed $10 to, to finish out buying a part so they get back home in Virginia. Well, I had $12. I gave him 10 of it. I had a half a tank of gas in that old car. I drove all that week, all that week, that half a tank of gas. It never moved. That hand never moved. I said, this got to be uh, something wrong with it. It's going, I'm going to run out in time. I know it's going to run out, and I did. I'll just have to call my daddy, see if he, or my, 
brother said he'd come bring me some gas. I drove for five days and never moved off of the half of the mark. And when I went to fill it up on Friday, because I got paid, I was making good money back in. I made $85 a week. Worked 40 hours, made $85. You can figure out how much I was making. Went by, filled it up, and it took the same amount to fill it up. The hand never moved. God learned, I learned to trust God in what He says, what He does. To love your enemies, to love them, to love them, and love them. If you don't, how does the dwell of God love within you? How does the love of God dwell within you, it says. And it says here in verse 19, And hereby know that we are of the truth, and shall assure our hearts before Him. Back to the heart of the matter. We shall assure our hearts before Him, because we're doing it in respects of Him. We're doing it by truth. We're not lying to Him. We're telling Him we're not lying to our neighbors. And it goes right back to verse 11 before he started this. And that same chapter. For this is the message that you heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. You've heard that from the beginning, have you not? That we should love one another. Continue to. We must continue to love one another. And it says that if we don't love one another, then we cannot have the love of God in us. Even back in the book of Acts, it tells about when the disciples were scattered and they were afraid. He was in the upper room. They, he, Jesus told them, said, wait there before he, when he ascended. He said, wait for the promise of God. Wait for the Holy Spirit. You'll have power on high. What did he do? They waited. When you're waiting, then you can pray too. A lot of people say, well, they get waiting, they get to worry. If you've got time to worry, you've got time to pray. Worry does not do nothing to you but cuts you down. It don't add anything to you, but it takes away. I've seen people worry and they don't want him to eat. They get sick from it. Don't worry. Pray about it. If you love your father and you've had and, and the father's in you and you and the father, it tells us to trust him. He's working it out. Just put him to the test. He'll show up. Trust me. We should do as Jesus has gave us commandments to love one another as we have loved as he has loved us. Do not know right what we are we're doing. We're do, we know what we're doing here. Right living will bring successful prayer life. Because if you stay in Him, you're abiding in Him, you begin to pray, and God Himself will begin to answer you, and He'll begin to encourage you and strengthen you physically, mentally, spiritually, and financially that we may continue to do those things. But a lot of people don't. They run headlong, and they want to do for themselves. Until they get into trouble, is that's when they, then they'll call for Jesus to help them. Lord, you've got to help me. I'm in so bad a need. But we must continue to do what God wants us to do, is to love one another, love our brothers and our sisters, love our enemies, and to love your neighbors. A lot of people don't even love their neighbors. I watch a program on uh, nighttime. It says, uh, hate your neighbor. People feuding all the time over a piece of ground, feuding over noise, or their cars parked the wrong way, even snow blowing. I watched one the other night there, the, guy, the lady was blowing snow off of her driveway in the other guy's driveway. Instead of blowing it in her yard, he blowed it over. He ended up killing her over it. Over snow. There's no love in person when you do that. All he had to do was go and say, can you turn it the other way? I heard a story many, many years ago about a young man. He bought him a new house. A lost young man. He bought him a house in the suburbs. A beautiful place. Had a picket fence in the front. Had a, a what do you call those uh, gate, uh, fences, and uh, privacy fence. Had a privacy fence all the way around it. Big yard, his two children, his wife, his wife and kids go to church. He would not. He said he didn't need it. And you've heard people that today. I'm not going to church. The next door neighbor, as they got settled in, came over. How you doing today? I'm so and so. I'm going to tell you about Jesus. I invite you to church. Well, the wife listened closely because she wanted to go to church. 
been about it. He told me, he said, I'm not interested. My wife might be. Well, the kids and the wife went to church. He come by every week, invite him to church. He said, I told you I don't want to go. Leave me alone. He'd done this several times. He finally told me, he said, I don't want you coming back and over here. Don't come over here no more. So to give him an idea that he didn't want him to come back anymore, he began to not carry his garbage out front. He began to throw it over the fence to the, young, to the, to the other man, the one who invited him to church. Every day, he'd throw his bag of garbage over the fence. No matter what it was, he always threw it over the fence. He'd done this for two years. Invite you to church. Invite you to church. Never mentioned the garbage. Never mentioned it. Two years. Come by. He started out one morning, a young man did, to work. Real foggy. Real foggy. The day before, the, the senior man came by and asked him, he said, will you go to church? He said, I'm going to pray that God will give you something to change you, show you that you need to change. Okay, whatever. Just quit coming by here. Well, the next morning was a real foggy morning. Kissed his wife and children goodbye and it started out. The fog got thicker and thicker and thicker. And he could not see, so he just pulls over and stops. He said, man, I've never seen fog like this. It's so thick, you couldn't cut it with a knife. Well, he started to go again. It's flicked up, but his lights wouldn't work on his car. And he got out to lift the hood to see what was going on. The fog set back in quickly. The lights were working. It was just so foggy he couldn't see. As he stepped around the car, this 18-wheeler come by. Whew! And the mirror, he was so close, the mirror just missed his head. And he said, boy, I could have got killed then. What would I have done with my wife and kids if I'd have died? I don't have no life insurance. I don't have nothing planned and I would probably go to a place I don't want to sit back in his car and begin to ponder on that and his wife had left her Bible in the car and he opened it up and she said it was highlighted for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life and he personalized it he put his name in there and he just asked him, he said, God, does that mean me? And he spoke to him clearly. He gave his heart and life fire on the side of the road, got out on the other side of the car this time, and got down and asked God to forgive him and forgave him. Drove him back, drove back to the house. Didn't go to work, drove back to the house. He said, I went a mile and the fog lifted up and it's gone. Clear, sun shining. And then I looked back and there's no fog. Hmm. He pondered on that and he couldn't understand why. Got back home, his wife and, and, and children hadn't gone to school yet. They were still there. He went in the house and closed the door and told them what was going on. They were rejoicing. And they, all of a sudden, <laughs> knock on the door, the next door neighbor. He opened the door and he said, I've heard some good news about you this morning. Are you that close to God that you hear the good news? That's what it means about loving our neighbors. He won him to the Lord just by collecting his trash and throwing it out. Now, today's modern times, they would probably have been a feud. They'd probably cut a hole in the fence and shoot each other. But the Bible teaches us to love our neighbors no matter what the cost. No matter what the cost, to love our enemies. But a lot of people don't do that. Verse 48, back in chapter 5 of Matthew. It's the last verse of this chapter. It says, Be ye Therefore, perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven, perfect. So this session of the Sermon on the Mountain is a summary of the, with the statement, Be ye therefore perfect. It says, Since the New Testament is clear that even the believer is capable of sin, the term perfect is not to be taken as a sinless perfection. Perfection here means complete. That is possessing a complete love like, like Christ, like God, embracing those who love you as well as those who do not. Plain and simple. We're to love one another 
plain and simple, that Christ taught us to love one another, to continue on to love one another, even when you see the worlds that's around us falling apart, we continue to, as I watch the TV, not before last, I think it was, I watched the news. And the ladies were uh, protesting abortion. They want the abortion laws back in. I think the state of Louisiana and Texas and Mississippi right now are, are battling in the Supreme Courts about abortion. The lady said, holding up her sign, she said, there's nobody in this world or any other place, person, man, or anything that can tell me what I can do with my body. Now, she'll have to give an account for that one of these days. But the Bible teaches us not to kill. Even the murderer would turn from his murderous fates. But it says the abortion rate right now is higher than the Kobe rate. Do you know that? We've had several, over 700,000 Kobe patients die. Today's rate is 279 or 273 days since the beginning of the, of the year. That's 816,000 children have been aborted in the U.S. alone. That's not in the world. That's in the U.S. alone. Forty million colored folks live in this country. Forty million colored folks. Last year they aborted 20 million of their own children. What's wrong with this country? What's wrong with us? How can we get out of this state of craziness? We're destroying our uh, statues, trying to re-erase history. That's socialism, communism coming along. They want you to do that. Forget about your past. We don't know what to do about the future, and they'll lead you where you need to go. Craziness. Wars, rumors of wars. We don't know, and we don't know which way to turn to. Well, we must turn to God. Turn to His Word. It tells us back here what we should do. Take it, Chronicles 7:14. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray, seek my face, and turn from their evil, from their from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, and I will forgive them their sins and heal their land. So now, folks, it's not up about the lost. It's about us, me included. If you want to see this change, this is what we must do. This is what God said to do, the people which are called by his name, not those that's lost, those that's not. And the only way you're going to love your enemies is to find the love of Christ. And to find the love of Christ, you must be able to be spoke to, taught to, read his word. If we read the written word, will know more of the living word, which is Jesus. We must continue to go on. And that's what we must do. And it's our duties as Christian folks, when they persecute us, when they take advantage of us, is to love them, no matter what. No matter what the cost. If you remember what your Savior done, He paid it all no matter what the cost He paid. If you remember, he, as He hung on the cross, the blackness of the, was, of the world was three hours. If you'll take your pen or a pencil and put a dot on it, just like this here, that dot right there represents your sins. This dot from this thing. All the sins you've ever had in your life. You can't see that. But if you take the multitude of the world and put it for that three hours of darkness that he hung on the cross, there's a lot of sin past, present, and future. He died for it all. And all you got to do is accept him the free pardon of sin and live the best you can for him. Do what he says. He says plain and simple in John's Gospel, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. If you don't love me, you won't keep my commandments. It's all about the love. And it's what's in the heart that counts. So I ask you out there tonight, as I close here, what's in your heart tonight? Is there anything in there? The Bible teaches us if you'll take that, your elevator down in your own heart, take the key that unlocks it and steps in, turn the light on and see where Jesus is at in it. 
Is he right there in front saying, I'm, you're doing well, you're doing good? Or is he back there in the 14th room at your heart, back there somewhere back and he, you can't get the key to work because it's rusted up, hasn't been opened in so long. And then when you get in there, you can't find him because the spider webs are so much in there. What's in your heart tonight? Uh, do we have any, Charles, do we have any uh, uh, prayer requests and all those? Let me get my paper here. Now, do we have any prayer requests? Uh, do, do, do Christine Beebe's watching? Do you just have any prayer requests tonight? I've got, I've got a couple myself. Remember Geneva Dutton? Uh, she went to her, have her second treatment today, and the doctor advised her to go to the cardiologist, her cardiologist, and see her. So remember Jenny Bedutton. And David Belcher, continue to remember David. He's got cancer. Remember him, he can't find a doctor. His doctor went out on maternity leave, and they left a, he called it a student, or uh, nurse practitioner, I think it is, in charge, and he's having some, some problems, and he needs to find a, a regular doctor, and he's been trying to find one. Pray that the God, good Lord will give him a doctor this week. And remember Pat Lyles. Pat had surgery today on her heart. She had a, she called it a stiff valve in her heart. Uh, they put a pacemaker in temporarily, but the surgery went well. She may get to come home tomorrow. And if anybody wants to volunteer to make a meal for them, see me afterwards or call me at home. Uh, uh, me and I'm going to do something tomorrow night, and Curtis is going to do something on Friday. And we need at least for four or five days until she gets back on her feet because she's had both growing. They went up both growings with the cat heart cath. And she, she told me the other day, she said, I don't know how I'm going to do all this. And he said, my legs are so sore my, before they'd done the first cath. And she said, uh, I don't want nobody coming in cleaning my house or cooking me dinner. She said, I just don't, I'm, I'm old-fashioned. I'll clean it myself when I get able. I said, well, we can find you something to eat. She said, well, that's okay. You can find me something to eat. So remember Pat and Harold. Uh, they've struggled. Of course, she's lost her brother with Kobe, and I've lost my brother with Kobe. Continue to remember those families. Uh, we... Says, uh, yes, remember Phyllis Jenkins and her daughter Tanya? Uh, they're still in the hospital with Kobe, re recovering from that. Phyllis has been, uh, they didn't want to put her on a ventilator, but she didn't want to go, said she'd never come off of it. So continue to remember her. She's still got Kobe. And her daughter, I think she's trying to learn to walk again, I think, from that. So it affects people differently. Uh, I know it affected me. It didn't get any prettier, but it affected me other ways. But let's remember Phyllis and, and Jenkins and her daughter. Anybody else with a prayer request? I got a praise and a prayer. Okay. okay. Praise. Darren and I signed the papers to close our house in Alaska this morning. Yay! And prayers for the people that have bought our house because they have been less than honest with us and your your lesson tonight was, yeah. <laughs> We're loving them. We're loving Love them. Love them anyway. <laughs> Sometimes the Lord's a nail on the head just at the right time. You never know when you may. And, and some of you may not like this lesson about love. And some of you out there in the, in, the, in the world may not like it. You may still hate your neighbor. Well, I'm telling you, it won't lead to nothing but destruction. Destruction for both of you because they've lost out and you have too. We must continue to love no matter what it is. I'm telling you, uh, I had a guy, at my next door neighbor, he asked me why I cut this yard. He said, you cut that and nobody helps you. Why do you do that for? Because I love them. I love them. I love mowing. I love uh, doing what I can for the Lord. And if mowing, and if I had to get up there and I need to mow in heaven, it'll be streets of gold I'll be mowing. I won't have to worry about, I'll have gold dust flying around me. Then I will be happy. But we must continue to keep going. 
Anybody else? Diane Palmer, remember her? I think she goes to the uh, cardi heart, heart, the cardiologist. I'll get it out in a minute. She goes this week. Uh, she goes to my cardiologist, Dr. Brewer. We go to the same doctor. Uh, she's had some problems, so remember her this week. And let's see. Anybody else? Yeah, I wish you would pray for my son David and his wife. They adopted a, a boy from a lady who was a street woman. And they're having a terrible time with him. In fact, he stole $90 and been a, just always doing something that they can't get him to obey. So they're just a terrible time with him. Let's remember that. That's a hard love, but it's it's worth it in the end, folks. Trust me. No matter how much it costs, we must continue to love. Anybody else with a prayer request? Let's see. I've got one more. I remember Tom Brown. He is a lost neighbor of ours. Pray that the Lord will open up the door for him to listen more. That's what it needs to be because he don't want to listen to it. And, and Kathy Owens. Kathy is my one. I've been praying for her for years, and she lives the next door neighbor. Been there for years. Her husband has done pie stone. Got right one afternoon. Many times we witnessed to him. His buddy, his buddy is named Johnny. It lives up in the upper end of Tennessee. He came by and witnessed to him on uh, Tuesday one afternoon. And he, he asked him if he wanted to accept the Lord. He said no. But he walked down the street the next morning to one of the neighbor's ladies. Her husband had passed away recently. And, and she, he just sat down on the porch. And, and she just asked him, said, Would you want to be saved today? And he said, Yes, I do. She let him know the Lord there right on her front porch. It was a few weeks later he went on to be with the Lord. Don't wait too long, folks, if you're lost out there. Don't wait till the last breath. Accept Christ now and do work for Him. I heard an old story about a, a lady that, that loved the Lord many years ago. And she worked for this rich lady in a big mansion. And she always spent her money on other people. The, the lady that worked for her. And the rich lady always told her, said, why, why you do that for her? She said, because I'm sending up materials to heaven. What well, do you mean materials? She said, well, the Lord teaches us if we give and we love and we do what the Lord teaches, he said he goes to prepare a place for us. And he goes to prepare a place, prepare a place for us. He's come again to receive us. And where I am there you may be also. And he said, in my father's house is many mansions. She said, I'm going to send up building material that he may, be a, may have a good mansion. Well, the lady passed on many years of service to her. And she went. The rich lady hired somebody else, and she passed away. Well, they got up to heaven. She got to heaven. Come on in. Come on in. Because the, the lady had led her to know Jesus. She come back in, and she said, I want to find so-and-so. Oh, yeah. I said, she's right down here. They walked down the streets, and this building was tremendous. Such a beautiful mansion. And she was sitting on the front porch. Oh, it's so good to see you. She ran down to hug her and kissed her. And she said, oh, I'm so thankful you're here. I'm so thankful. Well, after she had passed away, it was just a couple of years before the rich lady had passed away. So they walked down the street, got to the end of the street. There's a small cabin at the end of it. The Lord said, here's yours. She said, why is it so small? You never send up much materials. So if you're out there, folks, love your neighbor. Do what you can for them. Send those materials on over to the other side that you may have a great big mansion over there. But most of all, your rewards will be those that you lead to Jesus. That's the reward that you most likely will love when you get there. The Bible takes, speaks about five crowns. We're going to throw them all at Jesus' feet. But those that you win for the Lord and do from them for them, those are the rewards that would be most precious when you get there.
Anybody else with a word? If not, Charles, I'm going to close it out with the Lord, the Lord of Prayer. But especially remember these prayer requests. Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for your many blessings, and we ask you blessings on each and every prayer request that's been mentioned here today, Father. And let us not forget to pray for them daily, for it's our, our duties as Christians is to pray and to seek after those. And Father, that's what I try to encourage our men to come on Saturday night, to pray for those, to, get our, to continue to pray that we may be able to see this world move in such a mighty way. We can fight our battles on our knees because, God, you're in control. And help our men to may come, they may understand it, we, not just to, to fight the battles, but to get our hearts right with you completely. That when we do face these worlds and persecutions, that we can stand fast and hold on to the rock of salvation and to lift up the name of Jesus, that you may be glorified in all things, Father. We love you now, Lord, and thank you for this time. Uh, continue to watch over those who are sick and afflicted and to help us this old Kobe might pass by, Father. And we give you all the praise in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Amen.